So praying this morning is awesome. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for another opportunity to come and serve you and meet you at your table and remember what you've done for us. We just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come and fill us, anoint this teaching, help everybody to learn something and grow. And again, thank you. Bless us, guide us, anoint us, fill us with your wisdom and knowledge, give us insight and understanding. And again, thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So just a quick reminder, next week the clocks are going to change again. This is the bad one, right? Because we set the clocks, we spring forward, so we lose an hour. So make sure you set your clock so you're not late next Sunday. Because that's, you know, always awkward. So since we finished up the book of Revelation, I had many conversations with God about what to do next. I was just throwing up the idea of going to Genesis because I love that book and there's so much to learn there. And but he kept leading me to, to Matthew. I like, you know, if you're going to start something new, just start at the beginning. So I decided to go through the book of Matthew. So today we're going to start chapter one. Surprise, surprise. So it's going to be two parts. I'm not going to get through the whole chapter today. Whew, right? Anyway, it's interesting how the the Old Testament is the law, right? And into the New Testament is, is a new covenant of peace. But as we turn from the Old Testament to the New Testament, we turn from the book of Malachi, which is the end of the Old Testament, into Matthew. For us in our Bibles, it's just a turn of a page, right? But that actually spanned like 400 years between when Malachi was written and those prophets finished prophesying, and when Matthew wrote his book. So the Jews got no word during that time from God. He was silent. No prophetic words, no instructions, no rebuke or encouragement. It was silent. Can you imagine that? They didn't have the Holy Spirit inside them like we do. I mean, they had the, the Bible, the Old Testament, a lot of it, but they didn't have like what we have. We have the Holy Spirit in us. Can you imagine not hearing from God for 400 years? And how excited they should have been when Matthew popped out his gospel and Jesus showed up on the scene. That time period of 400 years was known as the silent years. So God was silent. I'm glad that we're not living in those times. But So, starting with Matthew, you have to kind of look at the Gospels, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Or Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are considered synoptic Gospels. It means they have similar viewpoints and characteristics. It's those guys viewing what Jesus did and the stories that they tell it all lines up together, but each person has a little different perspective. So their viewpoints, but it's, it's the same. They're watching the same event, but they tell the story just a little bit differently. But John, on the other hand, is what's called a supplemental gospel. It's very different from the others, right? But all four work in harmony to communicate God's good news the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, but each gospel has a different emphasis about Jesus. And I like how this all comes together. It's, it's so cool. Matthew views Jesus as the Messiah, the king, the king of the Jews. And he emphasizes all of his viewpoints with that in mind. Where Mark, he's shows Jesus as the lowly servant, the one who washed your feet, that served you. And Luke, he showed Jesus as the son of man. And John showed Jesus as the son of God. And then each one of those gospels actually has a symbol attached to it. Where Matthew, he talks about Jesus as the king, right? His symbol is the lion, the king.
king of beasts, the king of the world, the king of the Jews. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And Mark, the lowly servant, his symbol is the ox, which is an animal that just serves, pulls the plow. And Luke, the son of man, shows him as a man. That's the symbol, is a man's face. And John, of course, shows him as the son of God, which is represented as a symbol of the eagle. So it's just really intriguing how these symbols correspond to the four faces of the cherub in Ezekiel 1.10. How the Old Testament is a shadow of the New Testament, which is a shadow of God in heaven, right? And it also is similar to the creatures we see in Revelation 4, 7. But Ezekiel 1, 10 says, As for the likeness of their faces, each had the face of a man. Each of the four had the face of a lion on the right side. Each of the four, heads, um, four had the face of an ox on the left side. And each of the four had the face of an angel. These are angels that are around the throne of God in Ezekiel 1.10. If you read the whole chapter, you can see the whole picture. But um, for the interest of time, I just read the 10. Anyway, so it's these angels, and they each have four faces. And it's interesting. It's the same symbols, the same faces that the Gospels are lined up with. So each angel had four faces, each face corresponding with a tribe of Israel in the Old Testament, when they were going through the wilderness, God had them line up. When they would camp, they would set the Levites in the middle, and then the others would camp around it, north, south, east, and west. And there were certain tribes on each one that they had three tribes on each side, but certain tribes were the leader of that. And they're actually the same, and their, their standards or their flags had the same symbols. The lion, the, the ox, the face of a man, and an eagle. And when they lined up, there was one sect that had, the three tribes had more people than the rest. The others were equal. And when you would look at it from above, it made a cross. And that was before Jesus went to the cross. Revelation 4, 7 is the other example. The first says, the first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature like a calf. The third living creature had a face like a man. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. So these are the creatures that we saw. Remember in Revelation there, we saw these four creatures around the throne of God as Jesus came forward, the only one worthy to take this, the scroll out of the hands of God and open the seals. You want to see if that lady needs help? Sorry, there's a lady in the entryway that Sorry, distractions. Woo. Okay. In Ezekiel, it is four angels with four faces each. But here in Revelation, it seems like there's four angels with their own separate face. And, you know, so is it different types of creatures, different types of angels? where the ones in Ezekiel have the four faces each and these just have the one? Or, you know, is it the same type of angel around the throne of God? They each have four faces, but from John's perspective, he only sees one side of them, but he sees these four different faces on four different creatures. I don't know, but, you know, you have to think about these things. It's perspective, right? But anyway, it's just interesting how it all ties together. The angels around the throne of God have these symbols. The tribe of Israel going through the wilderness 
and the, the 12 tribes, they have these symbols. And then you see the New Testament, the Gospels, have these four symbols, how it all works together. The plan of the gospel was known before time began. It's, it's just amazing. To me, it is. And it's seen all around the throne of God, all through history. The plan of God, the salvation of the world. So, Matthew is written by a man named Matthew. Surprise. Woo. He is a Jew. And he writes the book of Matthew with the intent to save the Jews. He wrote it for the Jews, that they might believe Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is Messiah, that Jesus is their king. So that's his goal in writing this. He quotes more of the Old Testament scriptures than any other Testament writer, New Testament writer. He quotes the Old Testament like a hundred plus times. So he really brings in the Old Testament and says, Jesus is because. It is believed that Matthew, the book of Matthew, was written around 50 A.D., which was before the temple was destroyed in 70 A.D. by the Romans. So because there's some references to the temple in his gospel uh, as if it was still there. So it had to be before 70 AD. So, A casual reading of the New Testament may cause a person to wonder why it begins with something as seemingly dull as a family tree, which is what we're going to cover today. If you've read Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, it starts with genealogy. One might conclude that there is a little significance to be drawn from this cat. Um, catalog of names, and thus skip over it to where the action begins. Anybody have that thought process? Yeah, I can hear the chuckles. Yes. However, the genealogy is indispensable. You got to start there. You got to have it. It lays a foundation for all that follows. Unless it can be shown that Jesus is the legal descendant of David through the royal line, it is impossible to prove that he is the Messiah, the king of Israel. So Matthew begins his account where he must, with the evidence that Jesus inherited the legal right to the throne of David through his stepfather Joseph. His stepfather, we'll get to that later. This genealogy traces the legal descent of Jesus as king of Israel. The genealogy in Luke's gospel, on the other hand, traces his lineal descent as the son of David. Matthew's genealogy follows the royal line from David through his son Solomon, Solomon the next king, where Luke's genealogy follows the bloodline from David through his son Nathaniel. Or Nathan, sorry. But this genealogy concludes with Joseph, of whom Jesus was the adopted son. The genealogy in Luke 3 traces the ancestry of Mary, of whom Jesus was the real son. A millennium earlier, God had made an unconditional agreement with David, promising him a kingdom that would last forever and perpetuate a ruling line. You can read about that in Psalms 89. That covenant is now fulfilled in Christ. He is the legal heir to the throne of David through Joseph and the actual seed of David through Mary. So both his parents have the genealogy that is required to prove his worthiness to be king. Because he lives forever, his kingdom will last forever, and he will reign forever as David's greater son, as his heir. Jesus united in his person the only two bases for claims to the throne of Israel, the legal and the lineal. 
Since he still lives, there can be no other claimant. He's the only one that is worthy, the only one that can have that claim. Because every Jewish king must have a record of his right to the throne, Matthew launches out by giving the genealogy of Jesus Christ. A genealogy so interesting that we could spend years studying it. Each name has a story behind it. What God did with them and through them and why God chose them, right? But in the interest of time, I'm only going to mention a few of these things so that we can get through the book of Matthew before the next millennial comes. Hopefully we, you know, get raptured and just skip the whole thing, but there is a lot to learn in the names. So next time you think about skipping over it, maybe think, okay, these names are in the Bible for a reason. I'll think about each one a little bit more or look up their backstories a little bit. So let's dive in. Read with me, if you will. Verse 1. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac. Do you know that Abraham was a liar? <laughs> he lied a couple of times just to save his own skin, right? He like went to the king of the city he was in and said, oh, she, he said his wife is his sister, which is only a partial lie because she was kind of like his half-sister. I believe they had the same dads. But still, it's still a total lie because they were husband and wife, and he said that to them so that they wouldn't kill him. Because, you know, kings would like to add beautiful women to their harem, and so if he was married to them, the king, you know, wouldn't be able to add her to his harem unless by some weird chain of events, Abraham accidentally fell off a cliff or something, which is why he lied, because he didn't want to go fall off a cliff or get trampled by wild animals in the wilderness. Of course, that's just the story, right? Anyway, so Abraham, liar. Moving on, Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. You know, Jacob was a deceiver and manipulated people. He was conniving until the Lord got a hold of him, like many of us, right? I know I was not a really good person until God got a hold of me for real and changed my heart. God changed Jacob's name from Jacob, which means deceiver, to Israel, which means governed by God. But before that, he was a deceiver and a manipulator. Judah begot Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez begot Hezron, and Hezron begot Ram. Ram begot Aminadab. Aminadab <laughs> begot Nahashon, and Nahashon begot Solomon. I never said I could read names real well, so just bear with me. Solomon begot Boaz by Rahab. Boaz begot Obed by Ruth. And I'm going to talk more about these ladies in just a little bit. Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David, the king. David, the king, begot Solomon by her, her who had been the wife of Uriah. So, David, we all know his story, right? He committed adultery. He saw the wife of Uriah, or we know her better as Bathsheba. Uriah is the man that David had killed so that he could steal uh, Bathsheba from him, or he stole Bathsheba and then had him killed. So he's an adulterer and a murderer, and yet he's a man after God's own heart. And he's in the genealogy of Christ. All these people, isn't that amazing? They're wicked, evil. But God takes that and fixes it like he did with all of us. It just goes to show you God is never finished. 
even after we fail, he continues to work in us and through us. So never give up on yourselves either. There is grace and forgiveness for sinners. Yet David is listed in the genealogy of Jesus. It's wild that God uses broken people to make such amazing things happen. Verse 7, Solomon begot or Rehoboam. Rehoboam begot Abijah, and Abijah begot Asa. You know, Solomon, he's an interesting guy. You know, he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. Can you imagine that? It's like, think of the closet space you would need. Y'all women think, you know, just think how many shoes that is. Anyway, sorry. But he engaged in idolatry, being led astray by his many wives. I can't fathom having that many wives. Whew. How many years it would take to just see one of them a day? <laughs> it's like, what? And that's in 1 Kings 11. Solomon set up altars to other gods. They call them high places, right? They actually sacrificed children on these altars. You know, we always think of Solomon as the wise man and all this, and he was that, but this is another aspect of his life that he lived. And yet God put him in the genealogy of Christ, the Savior of the world. Rehoboam begot Abijah. Rehoboam actually split the kingdom of Israel in his day. He was rebellious and divided the kingdom. So you see all these different aspects, these sinful things. So we can relate to these people, I think. You know, we don't all have these, all of these, but each one of you have a specific sin that haunts you the most, right? Anyway. Asa begot Jehoshaphat. Jehosh, Jehoshaphat begot Joram. And Joram begot Uzziah. You know, Joram, he was a murderer. Big time. He killed six of his brothers because he was afraid they might steal his throne. So he just whoosh, killed them for no reason other than that. And yet God used him. Uzziah begot Jotham, Jotham begot Ahaz, and Ahaz begot Hezekiah. Hezekiah begot Manasseh, Manasseh. Manasseh begot Amon, and Amon begot Josiah. So Manasseh was one of the evilest kings that there was in Israel. You know, when he became king at about 13 years old, I believe. He rebuilt all the high places to the false gods. And not only did they sacrifice children, he sacrificed his own son on these altars. Can't imagine sacrificing your own child like that. But they did. You can read all about that in 2 Kings 21. And yet he's still in the line of Christ. How God takes broken, bad things and makes good out of it. It's amazing. Josiah begot Jeconiah and his brothers about the time they were carried away to Babylon. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconiah begot Shealtiel, and Shealtiel begot Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel begot Abiud. Abiud? Abiud begot Eliakim, and Eliakim begot Azor. Azor begot Zadok. Zadok begot Akim, and Akim begot Eliud. Eliud begot Eleazar. Eleazar begot Methan, and Methan begot Jacob. So Matthew begins by saying Jesus is the rightful heir to the throne of Israel. 
both genealogically and royally. Genetically is what I'm trying to say. (laughs) He is the son of Abraham in the book of Genesis. God made a promise to Abraham that through his seed, the entire world would be blessed. And I believe we are. Paul would later say that the word um, God used was seed, singular, not seeds, plural. And that seed was Christ. So royally, he is the son of David. One day, David said to the prophet Nathan, I want to build a house for God. Nathan's like, far out, let's do it. But that night, the Lord came to Nathan and said, no, no, no. David has blood on his hands. He's a man of war, not of peace. His hands are full of blood. So Nathan, go tell David that he can't build a house for me. But instead, I'm going to build a house for him. Our God has a way of tempering our disappointment with even greater blessings that we had no idea were coming. And that's exactly what happened with David. Is it a bigger blessing to build a house for God or have God build you into a great nation, into a house? The house of David. The house God built through him was Jesus, the Messiah who's going to be on the throne for all eternity. What a legacy, right? Forever and ever, without end. The Jews knew the Messiah must be of the seed of Abraham and a son of David. Did you know there is only one Jew able to make that claim in all the world now? Back in AD 70, when the Romans destroyed the temple, they also destroyed all of the genealogical records of the Jews. It's all destroyed. Thus, there is no Jew today who can claim with certainty and authority to be a son of Abraham and a son of David, except for Jesus Christ. They don't have their records to prove it. His genealogy recorded in this first chapter of Matthew is the only preserved genealogy that fits both requirements. To the Jewish student, this is heavy because they can't do it so that Jesus can. They're like, well, but they don't believe that he's Messiah anyway, but that's a whole other story. You mean there is a Jew who can really trace his genealogy back to Abraham? Yes, his name is Jesus of Nazareth, who you rejected, who you hung on the cross. There is something in this genealogy that must have blown the minds of the Jews who studied it through. So after Matthew wrote this, Jews would have read read it and say, what, this just isn't right because there are four women named women just shouldn't be in genealogies according to them in verse 3 we see Tamar in verse 5 we see Rahab and Ruth in verse 6 we find Bathsheba this would be a mind blower because you see Jewish men pray daily they said God I thank you that I am not born a Gentile or a dog or a woman. Thank you. That was their prayer. So they put women in the same category as dogs and Gentiles. It was a tremendously male-oriented kind of society where women's names never were included in genealogies. So what's the Lord doing here? (laughs) He's saying, the kingdom I'm establishing is different from the kingdom the Jews are expected. 
I mean, the Jews expected the Messiah to come and kick out the Romans and set up his kingdom and lead back then. But Jesus wanted to do something different. God had a bigger plan. Paul would later write that in Christ there is neither male or female, for Jesus is the great liberator of women. In Galatians 3, 28. You can study history. Wherever the gospel has been rejected, women have been treated poorly. Even in sophisticated societies. Consider the Grecian culture, for example. The Greeks, perhaps the most sophisticated society in history, actually believed that every man should have three women. How do you women feel about that? <laughs> he would have a legitimate wife who, with whom he would make babies. <laughs> and then he had a woman that he could just sit down and talk with. So he had conversation. And then he would have a third that he would have sex with to satisfy his fleshly needs. But wherever the gospel has gone, women have been elevated. And we see that, right? Because the Jews placed a high priority on family responsibility, Tamar's name in verse 3 would have been a real shocker to the mind of the Jewish reader. You might remember her from the 38th chapter of Genesis. Judah, one of the 12 sons of Jacob, had three sons, Ur, Onan, and Shelah. The oldest son, Ur, married Tamar. And scripture records that Ur did wickedly before the Lord, and he was killed. The cultural practice, which was later recorded in Deuteronomy 25, was such that if a man died and left a woman without child, what did they do? The younger brother was to marry her, and raise offspring in the name of his deceased brother. This happened in order that his heritage might continue. And the property that they own would be passed on and stay in the tribe that they belonged to. So when Ur, Ur died, Onan was obligated to marry Tamar. But Onan refused to impregnate her. Therefore, because of the hardness of his heart in saying, I'm not going to allow her to raise children in my brother's name, the Lord killed him as well. Now Ur is dead. Onan's gone. And Judah says, I've got one more son. Do I want to give my last son to her? It's got like a bad trend going on here. It's not very good. Understandably concerned as a father, he says, listen, Tamar, wait until Sheila gets a little bit older, and then I'll give him to you. Just be patient. We'll get there. But the years went on. Sheila grew up, and Judah didn't keep his promise. So Tamar changed her outfit and dressed up like a whore and veiled herself as a harlot and set beside the road where Judah traveled frequently. This always gets me out of you. <laughs> Judah, noticing this harlot whom he hadn't seen before, ooh, a strange woman, approached her and sought to make a deal with her. He didn't have his wallet with him, so she said, give me your ring, give me your staff, give me your bracelet, and that will do for now. You can give me the sheep you owe me later. So they had sexual relations. And he left her with his ring and his bracelet and his staff and had no idea, of course, with whom he was dealing since she was completely veiled. This whole tradition thing kind of blows my mind. But a few months later, the news is out in the town and in the community. Tamar the widow of Ur and Onan, the daughter-in-law of Judah, has played the whore. She's pregnant. Judah said, let her be burned. 
Why is it that the men never have responsibility for their actions, you know? And she answered him, hey, do you know whose ring this is and this staff and this bracelet? You know, this stuff, whose is this? Hmm? <laughs> Judah's jaw must have dropped, right? What? Oh, no. You mean that was you? <sighs> I have done wrong. He realized he had done wrong because he didn't give her his son Judah realized he was at fault in failing to care for his family in a way that was traditionally and customarily, um, customarily proper. In holding back his son, Judah had robbed Tamar of her rightful seed. It's a sordid story, to say the least. How You know, it's like just visiting a prostitute walking down the road is, you know... <laughs> But yet, anyway, we'll get over that. Can't you see the Lord saying, let's put Tamar in the genealogy for these Jews who are so proud of their male superiority and their sense of family responsibility? It just would, like, be poking them with a stick, right? The Jews not only valued family responsibility, but they also valued sexual purity, which, you know, listening to that last story makes you go, do they? But they do. And guess who is named in the genealogy? A prostitute named Rahab. In the days of Joshua, when the spies came to scope out Jericho, it was Rahab who hid them and covered up for them. So she helped them. She is honored not only by appearing here in the genealogy of Jesus Christ, but in the listing of the hall of faith that we see in Hebrews 11, that this prostitute could rise up to this level and be honored in this genealogy and look back on as somebody of great faith because she believed in the God of Israel. Rahab was a tremendous woman because in spite of her limited knowledge and understanding, she risked everything, believing that the God of Israel was the true and living God. Not only were the Jews concerned about family responsibility and more purity, or moral purity, but the third big issue was racial superiority. So determined were they that their racial line remained free from pollution. They believed that if you, as a Jew, even accidentally brushed against a Gentile, you would have to go home immediately, take off your clothes and burn them, and take a bath and put on fresh clothes. And guess who's in the genealogy? of Jesus, a Gentile, a Moabite of all people. You know, the Moabites came from Lot and his daughters. You know, the angels went to Sodom and Gomorrah and said, Lot, you got to leave. We're going to destroy the place. And so they ran Lot off, and he went into the wilderness with his two daughters. Remember, his wife didn't want to leave, so she looked back, and she became a pillar of salt. So it was Lot and his two daughters out in the wilderness, and the daughters are like, oh, we have no husbands out here, so let's get dad drunk and we'll make babies with him. And that's what they did. And because of that, that's where the Moabites came from. It's incest. So can you imagine the Jewish perspective of Moabites? Who the whole clan came from incest between Lot and his daughters, and yet they're in the genealogy of Christ. Third, Matthew draws attention to Bathsheba, referred to in verse 6 as she that had been the wife of Uriah. Even though she's not named by name, you know who she is. To the Jews, 
so proud of their history and particularly of their great King David. This reminder of his affair with Bathsheba and his subsequent murder of her husband, Uriah, must have been a particularly painful one. Again, God's kind of like poking him with a stick. But the inclusion of Bathsheba in this genealogy is a further indication that the Holy Spirit, through the pen of Matthew, desired to shake the Jews out of their pseudo-spiritual complacency to alert them of the coming Messiah. What does this say to me theologically? Well, it says that the stage is already set for the Lord to do a new work. My kingdom is the kingdom of heaven, not the kingdom of the nation of Israel. Israel was just a tool, a selected people. They were supposed to be the priest to the world, to share God's word, not to keep it to themselves. Not to realize or to believe that anybody that's not a Jew is a Gentile and they're filthy and dirty and we can't touch them. We can't sit down to dinner with them. But God has a bigger plan and they were just a part of it. It's much broader than Israel. It's a whole new thing. The Lord declares, behold, I make all things new. But personally, it reminds me that those words should never pass from our lips again. What words? The Lord can't use me because I've sinned greatly. I've shirked my family duties. I've messed up. I've fallen short. You can't say that legitimately anymore. All of these people did, and God used them anyway. You all fall short. I fall short. We're sinners saved by grace. We're messed up, and God got a hold of us and makes us a better thing. All these people in the genealogy of Christ are messed up, but God still uses them. The Pharisees may stick up their noses and say, how can this be? Let them know this. He does all things new, and he's included people like Rahab along with people like you and me. He is the friend of sinners. Hallelujah. Your family may have failures in the past, either 30 years ago Three minutes ago, or whenever. You might be a Moabitess, feeling you haven't had the education, theology, or haven't been Christianized culturally. So what? You have to know every verse of the Bible before you've arrived? No. You have to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, period. Then you start reading his word to find out what your God says. It's a journey. Join Tamar and Rahab. Join Ruth, who simply look at Naomi and said, You're a child of Israel, and wherever you go, I'll go. Your God will be my God. Your people shall be my people. Wherever you die, I will die there as well. She followed her because she believed the God of the Jews. She believed in the God of creation. No matter what she was, she became something new. The names go on for 14 verses, tracing the genealogy of Jesus through Abraham and David and on down to Joseph. As we pick up in verse 16, it says, And Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Notice that Matthew doesn't say, and Jacob begot Joseph, of whom was born Jesus, which was the wording he used in all the other father-son relationships. 
No, he specifically breaks the order by telling us very clearly that Jacob begot Joseph, but not Joseph, the father of Jesus, but Joseph, the husband of Mary. Mary was the real mother of Christ. Joseph was just his foster dad. You know that sin nature comes through the male. Even though Eve ate the fruit first, she was deceived by the devil. But Adam, when she offered it to him, he knew what he was doing. He was the real sinner. And he is the one that brought sin into the world and broke it. And so your sin nature comes from your dad. So the fact that Jesus is not Joseph's dad is key because he didn't have sin nature from birth. Like the rest of us, we're born into sin and have that nature that needs to, needs to have a savior. And we need to be born again in the spirit. Jesus didn't have that need. His father was the Holy Spirit who put his seed in Mary. But we don't get our sin nature through women, so he was born sinless and lived a sinless life. So he could be the perfect sacrifice for our sins. So as you can see, Jesus has the right to be king. Jesus is king. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is God fully God and fully man. And I know we can't fully understand how he can be man and God. Born sinless. He was tempted with everything that you and I are tempted with, but he didn't fall. He didn't sin where we do. And in the interest of time, that's where we're going to stop for today. And we will pick up next week. So let's say a quick prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, again, we just thank you. And Jesus, thank you for being our King, our Lord, our God, and giving us this evidence and this proof that you are worthy, that you are King. Thank you. Help us to, to understand these things, Lord.